Hello everyone and welcome to another lore wall. This one conveniently coming to you right before Notlin's release, talking about literally everything you need to know. Genshin's story has become honestly rather insane in scope over the years, and with us nearing the climax of this grand story, I thought some of you might need a refresher before jumping into the new region. Now, on the wall behind me are all the major and keyword major players in the Genshin story. I know it may look crazy because there are over 50 people behind me, but it's true. Everyone behind me is important. Now I'm going to break down the wall in sections of how it's all laid out so you can get a better idea of what you're looking at before we go into depth on some of the specific pre notlin topics. As always though, thank you guys so much for all the support. We are insanely close to 50,000 people here. So if you haven't and you want to bring me one step closer to that silver play button, hit the the subscribe button now and I don't know comment whatever favorite Notlin character you have or theory you're most excited for and do the YouTube things also tomorrow like if you're watching this on release day tomorrow on Twitch we are doing a super awesome collab with Roblox dressed to impress not only can you participate in a ton of fun events but you will have the chance to win some prizes including Welkins for Genshin or any of your other favorite gacha games like Honkai Star Rail or Withering Waves so feel free to follow me on Twitch by going down below and get a notification of when I go live now just to impress will happen before the Notlin live stream and I plan to be live from the tournament all the way to the 5.0 live stream. So you can stay and win some prizes, talk some Genshin lore with me in chat, and watch everything 5.0 together. I'm honestly so excited. I can't believe I got the chance to do this. If you haven't seen Roblox Dress to Impress featuring Genshin Impact, definitely go check out my Instagram reel. It like blew up. Also, hopefully I see you there so you win some prizes. All right, so the wall layout is very important. I took time on this one again. I will say though, when visually laying this out, a lot of things jumped out at me with patterns in the Genshin Impact story and made me realize a ton of lore. With a story as big as Genshin's, it's so easy to lose track of the million and one little groups within the story. All right, so it's going to make the most sense for me if I start on the left side of the wall, and this is where the major timeline of Genshin Impact exists. Do keep in mind this timeline is highly, highly debated. There are lots of little holes and things that don't make sense, but this is my interpretation of the order of events. Next to it, though, is the additional timeline of Chondria because I thought that was really important in the storyline especially as we're getting to the very end and then along the top of the wall I'm going to be calling this major powers so we kind of have things like elements or primordial water primordial fire celestia the cubes things that are like in nature very innate like very primal think like an atom something that is like truly the most minuscule scale of a theory or something in the world and then below that we kind of have like the highest echelon of gods so that's going to be including the shades fanes and then we have the ermensal tree and quantum sea do keep in mind this is again my interpretation of things in genshin impact like for instance the quantum sea might not be directly referenced but i know honkai impact third lore and i know honkai lore in general and i can tell when some Something is very obviously similar. Going back though to the major godly beings, we have the Shade of Life, Shade of Death, Fanes, Shade of Void, and Shade of Time. Now, I currently do have Sila representing both the death and life through my own headcanon theory, so take that into account. Also, due to the heavenly principles looking so similar to the Hersher of the Void from Honkai Impact 3rd, I am pretty much guaranteeing that the Shade of the Void is indeed Kiana Koslana. For those that don't know HI3, you're probably like, what? Just keep the name in your head. Genshin will eventually get there. Last but not least, confirmed in the actual lore is Istaroth, which is the Shade of Time. So to bring people up to speed on the lore, for those who don't know, originally the world was ruled by the seven sovereign dragons, along with the dragon king Nubalan. This actually has its own dedicated section as well. Underneath the Archons right here, there are some missing ones, and Nubalan is on the end. Now, at some point, the first descender, who was believed to be Fanes, came to this world and fought against the dragon. Dragons. To do so though, Fanes split themselves into four shades and won the war of the planet per se. After all that, the story of creation, yada yada yada, kind of like the Bible, kind of not. Now what we did come to learn recently through the lore in confirmation is that Agiria was created by the Shade of Life. For those that weren't paying attention, Agiria is actually the original Hydro Archon. Now this was due to the fact that the original Hydro Sovereign, who we don't know the name of or who they are, was slain and Fanes needed a replacement for the heart of the dragon that was also the domain of the primordial sea. People are probably so lost already, but just hold on, babes. Hold on. 
So this was a super interesting lore point because a huge question we've had in the lore, at least for me, is where the fuck did the Archons even come from? Like, they obviously don't have parents. This takes us into our next section, which is actually the Archon section. Now, as you can see, all the... God! You guys don't understand the struggles of this wall sometimes. Anyways, as you guys can see though, all the Archons currently are indeed connected to one of the shades or a primordial idea. Now, with Egeria being created by a shade, I began to speculate at that point that every shade had created an Archon of some sort. Now, maybe possibly some of the shades created multiple, but I tried to keep it one-to-one -one and I found a reasoning for everything, so this is kind of what I'm going with. So we obviously already know that the Shade of Life had created the Hydro Archon, and because death is such a polar opposite idea, to life, I kind of went with the theory that also when it comes to elements like water and fire that they would follow suit, so I am kind of predicting that the Pyro Archon was created by the Shade of Death. This also leads me to believe that there is something called Primordial Fire. I don't know if that's like the lava that everyone is swimming in in Notlin, or if that is related to Arlequino and her Bale Moon fire thing. For those that weren't paying attention in Arlequino in page 4.6, her fire or Bale Moon fire, which is the fire that is a deeper red color that does originate from Conria with the Crimson Moon Dynasty, had the ability to make people forget things like memories, which is really interesting because water almost feels like it preserves it in a way. So it was kind of opposite. I don't know, like it made sense in my head. Now the Shade of Time known as Istroth is known to have direct connections to Venti and also time having connections with the wind. Since the early days of Genshin, it's been speculated that Venti could have came from Istroth. So this was kind of like a no brainer. Now where it gets confusing is the Shade of the Void. Now where it gets really confusing is when you get to the Shade of the Void because because we have very little information to work off of. Now, in regards to the Heavenly Principles, I mostly had to work off of symbolism and honestly vibes. I was leaning heavily towards John Lee due to his Archon statue having him holding the cube, just like the Shade of the Void uses, but there was one other thing that kind of made me go in a different direction. And that is because in the Genshin Impact story, we do have a direct quote that says that the Heavenly Principles is closest to eternity, which is represented by A. Also, A has the ability to create a void-like space within the realm of consciousness. So because of that, I decided that Makoto and A were descendants of Kiana Koslana. And honestly, if you know HI3, let's be honest, they always are connected to each other with Mei and Kiana in other games, so it just made sense. This left me with three Archons and no more shades, so this is where it gets interesting. Zhongli has always been known to be mysteriously powerful with his voice lines being I will have order and the cube that he holds being similar to the cubes in the order found in Hawkeye Star Rail, the idea of order seemed to be consistent. Zhongli is also all about contracts and keeping things in line, so who says that he wasn't the first to draft out the heavenly principles or the commandments of this world in the first place? For this reason, I made him a direct descendant of Fanes himself. I'm not sure how this is explained, but maybe when Fanes split themselves into four shades, Zhongli was the remnant power that remain. Now, when it comes to Nihita, aka Ruka Davida, I like to think of her as a personification or echo of the Ermensul tree itself. We know Nihita came from a literal branch, so I believe Nihita may actually be the tree's life force especially since defending it is her number one priority. Now, this idea, I think, may be prevalent in other Hoyo games like Honkai Stara with Pom Pom, where in my mind, Pom Pom is possibly the spirit or life of the Astral Express. So when Fanes created the Urbansal Tree, which I assume is one of the first things that he did when creating the world before he created humans, I assume Nahida was also created then as well. Going back to this idea of opposites with fire and water and life and death and the Urbansal Tree being just a little too simple similar to the imaginary tree. I don't think it's too crazy for me to think that there might be an opposing force in Genshin like the Quantum Sea. I don't think we know what that is currently in the story, but I'm going to put my money on that being where the Cryo Archon originated from. Thematically, it makes sense since I do believe Bronya could be the one to take the spot of the Cryo Archon and her connections with the Quantum Sea in past games make it a little too convenient to not to go in that direction. Okay, that was a ton of information with all the Archons and their connections and where they came from. I'm almost certain though that this theory will be close to confirmed within the end of Notland's story, 
due to what I assume it will explore narratively. Now we may also get more information on our third descender, which did end up becoming the seven gnosises, helping further power the archons, and they are located right here next to our archons. Now below each of the archons are the sovereign dragons of each respected element. We do not know every single slot. Currently the most interesting one in my opinion is Electro because I actually have no clue who it could possibly be at this point. Many speculate that it lays below the Sakura tree due to the tumor we found below it but then that calls into question what the hell was Makoto and Istaroth doing when planting the seed? Was it actually defending or were they trying to hide something? I want to know. I feel like A's just been missing from the story, like all of Inazuma for a little too long and it's getting a little sus. The Pyro Sovereign will most likely have the largest role in the Notland story, even compared to the Pyro Archon, due to the fact that a lot of the information we know about dragons is currently rather limited and from Nouvellet. The problem is Nouvellet is a rather new dragon, only being 500 years old, and we don't really know if he retained the information from the previous dragon. It's even possible that the Pyro Sovereign is not currently alive in the Notland storyline, and this whole thing could be centered around bringing them back to life, hence the title of the actual chapter, Ode to Resurrection. Now, before we jump into that even further, I want to address the wings of the wall, you could say. In between this timeline of Archons, we have the newly discovered Sinners of Conria. And obviously we know that they're tied to forbidden knowledge, abyssal power, Honkai energy, whatever you want to call it at this point. These are most likely going to be the major players of the Conrian story, and you can find below the Conrian related people at the bottom. That being Clothar, who is in Indeed, the founder of the Abyss and was inspired by Vrldfornir, probably butchering that, and that is indeed Dane's older brother. His son, Kari Bear, who has now become the Loom of Fate, a mechanism which is most likely used to change the ley lines and edit both the past, present, and future of this world. When I tell you, this story goes in so many directions, and I am sick of it at this point. Lastly, we have Kaya, who is related to both Clothar and Kari Bear due to being Albrich lineage. He's also said to be the key component of the survival of Conria into the future. Now, I'm going to be honest, I don't think Conria will have a huge part in Notlin's story beyond Dane's quest. Notlin has a lot of explaining to do when it comes to the dragons and also second cycle of Tevat, which basically means there's already a ton on its plate. Now, moving over to the other side of the wall, we do have our lovely Fatui Harbingers. Do keep in mind though, there is a missing slot in between Pantalone and Child for the missing 10th Harbinger that we do not know who it is or if there's anyone even there. El Capitano is indeed the strongest of the Harbingers at the very top and will most likely be the main feature of Notland's storyline, at least it seems based on the promotion. But I do think that over the patch cycles, this might change. Like Arlecchino becoming way more relevant way later in the patch series. Now, based on the Harbinger wheel, Columbina should actually be the next boss fight. This leads me to believe that Capitano will be featured mainly in the first half, but not resolved in either leave or just like finish up what he's doing. And Columbina will later step into the story due to something that requires her. We could also see Genshin doing something interesting and extending Genshin's story beyond its typical three patch structure, so it's able to fit in more than one Harbinger. Now, with Columbina being involved, the story of Notland may lead us to talking about the cycles directly in the first cycle, Hyperborea. Many people speculate that Columbina is from the Unified Civilization, and this would make her similar to Arlecchino, which is a survivor of the cycle wipes. The ancient world, both of Notlantean and Hyperborea, seem to be like obvious story directions based on this. And I know a lot of people wanted Capitano to be the featured harbinger of this patch, but let me be so honest with you. Personally, I think Capitano is just way too strong for us to take on right now in the story, because technically, we didn't beat Arlecchino and we weren't ready. Now, lastly, all the way over on the very end is indeed the Hexen Zirkle Witch Coven. Seven out of the eight that we know currently, and there is still a single one that needs to be revealed. I don't know, guys, this might be Venti's Story Quest Part 2, and it might never happen, but regardless, I put them up here since they are connected to a lot of what we're talking about. Now that you know the entire wall, let's dive in deeper into these Notland related topics. Grab popcorn, pause, grab a drink, watch an ad. Let's go. The current timeline is divided into these main events. And again, like I said, I'm going to be 100% honest. I'm not even sure this is the right order. There's a lot of speculation on the cycles and wipes and how they even work. And when you get into the idea that this whole experience might just be happening inside of a giant supercomputer, it gets very, very crazy. But this is what I think is going on, at least currently. 
everything before Hyperborea is basically completely undocumented. And I will call it the time before fans or the dragon sovereigns roam the lands and controlled everything. Hyperborea is what I think is a creation of Tevat after the war with the dragons and the shades splitting. This is the time which I think that the unified civilization existed. So places like Enkidamia, Salvandagnir, and the Chasm. I'm currently unsure what causes the cycles to change into the next cycle. I assume it's some large planetary wide event, but again, we don't know. Now, the time of Notlantian seems to line up with the era of the Divine Nails dropping to repel forbidden knowledge along with Nubelung's return. Again, for those that don't know, Nubelung is the king of dragons. We know that an evil dragon is vanquished from the world during this time period and within Notland being the land of dragons. It only makes sense that it kind of lines up here as well. Now that whole period with the return of Nubelung is known as the Great War, and then that takes us into Remiria. You'll probably do a whole giant lore wall on its own for Remiria, but I'm gonna give you guys the fast version. So Remiria is a cycle period that happened right before what I think will be the Archon War. As we know, Egeria ruled after Remus, who is the king of Remiria. Remiria is a time in which civilization attempts to defy fate and actively work against it. Very similar to what's going on currently. In the end though, this results in the flooding and fall of Remiria along with that which would I suspect maybe at the same time the third descenders fall in split of the gnosis and then with the gnosis being created that takes us into the archon war the archon war seems to be the transitional period between remiria and what we know as cron aria now within cron aria is our experience of the conrian war 500 years ago and everything up to current day's story it is currently said in the game that we are halfway through this era so as you can see the discovery of notlantian and its event will kind of bring us one step closer in the final step of understanding the origins of mainly everything, at least in Tevat, and also possibly what their goals and motivations are. We also most likely will discover some lore from the very first humans of Tevat within Notlantia. All right, so moving on from that, we're going to be going into the Archons and my theories specifically surrounding the Pyro Archon and her role within this story. We have some interesting threads of fate that you could say to follow when it comes to her. Number one, we don't know who the original Pyro Archon Archon is, but we do know it is not Mavika. Venti and Zhongli are told to us to be the only true original, meaning there are some blanks to fill in. On top of that, within Genshin Impact's manga, the Pyro Archon is actually referred to as Murata. Now, this could be another Archon, or this could just be another name for Mavika. It is not the first time that the Archons have had multiple titles. On top of that, there could technically be any number of pyro archons before Murata, so this is very much an unknown territory. Now, with Aguirre's lore, we know that some of these archons, if not all of them, most likely existed from the beginning of everything when it comes to the shades creating to that. So, for all we know, there could be technically a lineage of like over a hundred pyro archons or so, though I doubt they'll do that. Currently, right now, we only have the other name, so I'm just going to leave it at that and we'll just kind of wait and see. The original pyro archon, though, will play a large role when it comes to the primordial dragon in the histories of dragons throughout Tevat. Now, Mavika does share a similar design when it comes to Murata from other games like Honkai Star Wars and Honkai Impact 3rd, so I personally think they are the same or at least direct descendants. In my opinion though, Mavika in the trailer does come off really strong in her demeanor and confident, making her look like a formidable opponent, kind of like Raiden did within Inazuma. Now, although Mavika isn't really threatening, there does seem to be a plan in the works based on the trailer that will lead the six tribes of Notland to converge in some way. Although Mavika seemed excited about the competition of Notland, the people themselves seemed rather disconnected. So this leads me to believe that Notland, unlike Fontaine, which had a lot of praise for their Archon and adoration, is going to have a pretty different view when it comes to their Archon. It might be a bit more uncaring and distant. Now, Mavika undeniably looks very similar to bikers in modern day, so I wonder how that will come into play beyond just her literally dropping a bike in her kit. Obviously, we know that all the characters in Notland so far have had some sort of different transformation of traversal, so I assume that's going to be there. Moving on, though, from the Archons to the dragons. When you think dragons, you think fire, so most likely this dragon is going to be a big deal, especially being the nation of dragons. I'm gonna be real, I'm gonna assume that he's also playable with the insane amount of popularity that came from Nouvellet. Now, I do think Nouvellet will involve themselves in the Notland storyline at some 
some point because it just makes sense with everything going on. I also do suspect though that the relationship between the Pyro Dragon and Pyro Archon will be strained if not hostile. You see with Nuvolet and Farina they were able to find common ground and understanding but with a Pep and Nahida it was more distant and uncaring. I think Genshin is going to want to give us a full spectrum of these relationships and the Pyro Sovereign and Mavika will be more like budding heads and rivals. Who knows maybe Capitano is the Pyro Sovereign that would be a pretty crazy thing. On top of that since Notlin does heavily lean into the idea of war I could go out on a limb and say that maybe they're going to give us the idea of an internal struggle or war for dominance over the full power of Pyro. All right so moving on to the Harbingers and Project Stooja. Now Harbingers are a staple in every arc of Genshin Impact story and we are having the strongest Harbinger currently present in Notlin. El Capitano is actually said to have powers beyond Archon level and being number one it really makes you start to ask yourself who the hell this could be and what type of power he's actually wielding. Now Arlecchino is on the cusp of typical elements that we see in Genshin Impact wielding Bale Moon Blood Fire. Now this is a fire with unique properties and I feel like Capitano, Columbina, Dottore will probably all wield unnatural elements themselves. Now with this topic in mind Capitano may be so strong that he may be able to achieve his goals without violence and just with the mere threat of annihilation. I personally believe Capitano will reveal to us knowledge from beyond this world which will be an easy way for him to bargain with the Pyro Archon and ourselves for the Gnosis. I do not think that we will go up against Capitano and instead we'll probably go up against Columbina who will be present on our travels through the unified world that was destroyed by the fell dragon a couple thousand years ago. Now this was a time where the Sealy race was present and a lot of theories think that Columbina was also from the civilization. The civilization and Sealy's were known to have abilities to communicate with the gods and Columbina could be a person that has the ability to communicate or at least to have knowledge of Celestia beyond the average typical person into that. Not only would this be an asset for the Fatui Harbinger team knowing what they're going up against but it kind of explains why Columbina is a little nonsensical and has a lot of connections to angels. Most likely the nonsense she's talking about are things from the previous era that she knows and I do think her eyes being covered in her design maybe a slight nod at her looking into forbidden knowledge and possibly going blind or something along those lines. Moving on to the Hexen Circle which is another group of interesting girlies that seem to be getting more and more prevalent as time goes on. The Hexen Circle is indeed a witch coven within Genshin Impact and I do think it's possible we may see a few of the members but I'm going to be so honest with you. I've lost all hope. It has been months years almost at this point we have gotten statues this year statues of two two there is literally still one missing from this list i am tired okay all i want is my american horror story witch coven and i want it now and i don't think i'm asking for much at this point alice is still a damn gramophone on my wall that's insane that's insane. Klee came out in 1.1. Where is her mom? Now moving on to Notlin topics. The Notlin cast will be broken up into six tribes, each most likely representing a single element, meaning one will be left out. Currently, the theories are split between two elements, Pyro and Cryo being left out, but a lot of people think that the bird within the First Nation teaser, I'm going to overlay it right now, is the one for the Pyro tribe, which is red, so that leaves Cryo being left out. Since a lot of Saurians take previous regions' exploration mechanics into mind when creating their own exploration mechanics, I think the reason they left out Cryo is because they don't want to spoil what's up and coming, which says Naya, but I'm sure there's an actual lore reason as to why, and it's probably really interesting. Now, for those who don't actually know, the Saurians are the remaining dragons of Notlin that have evolved over time. And from the trailer, what we know about Notlin's mechanics, it seems that Notlin is a region that has found a way to coexist with dragons and work together, giving a pretty obvious future storyline, especially since we didn't end up like hating Nuvolet. Now, we currently have three tribes confirmed in 5.0. I am 100% going to butcher these names. I'm telling you that right now. I will learn them. 
promise when I hear them in game. Number one is Mestali, also known as the People of the Springs. Now, these people are mainly guides and cartographers, and there are some relations within the lore to the moon, but we're gonna have to wait and see how that actually pans out and if it's just like a slight reference. Now, of course, the brand new five star Mulalani hails from this tribe and is currently able to ride on the back of a shark as a quick form of travel. The next tribe, Hushlan, is a tribe that dwells among the treetops. Kanish hails from this tribe and you can see from their abilities of being able to swing from tree to tree where this actual idea came from. The last tribe, Nonasayan, also known as the Children of the Echoes, focus themselves around mining and appraising of gems. Kachina, our small geo user with the giant drill machine, comes from this tribe as you can tell. Pretty obvious from all the tribes I've just described that they're rather thematic in nature, each having something unique to help identify them from each other. Also, their Saurian companions tend to be closely tied with this focus. You can even see this with characters' kids with the shark and water travel representing cartography and exploring new lands, the grapple hook from Kanish being related to treetops, and Kachina's drill being directly related to mining. Now, taking this idea though and applying it to the remaining three tribes that we do know exist, the first being a bird-like creature that also represents the pyro element, I think that this tribe may actually actually be within the sky, similar to Breath of the Wild's recent sequel, Tears of the Kingdom, that featured exploration beyond the clouds. Let's be honest, you guys, we all know that Genshin Impact took a ton of inspiration from Breath of the Wild in its 1.0 original form, so it's not surprising that the sequel was on everyone's minds in that development team. Now, we could see Notlin not only expand outwards, but also upwards, giving us a bit of a different taste for exploration as the team does like to shake it up region to region. Now, another tribal symbol, which I speculate to be the bat and be most likely Electro could also be related to flight in a way, but they are also found within caves. This could be another hint that Notlin will circumvent the typical horizontal exploration and feature expansions both into the air, but also underground. The tribe with the bat may also be tied to Electro due to its similarity with Electro Thunder Manifestation, an ocean-like creature that also has bat-like qualities to it. Lastly though, the final tribe representing Animo is the one I'm honestly the most unsure about. I can't even really tell what animal it's trying to represent. It's kind of giving me the vibe of a bunny. We could get like a super jump mechanic or something similar to animal slimes or their sort of like blimp like glider movement. But other than that, I don't really have much to go off of. Moving beyond the tribes though, what do we know about the actual cast of these Notland characters? Kachina, our 5.0 Geo user, is described to be hyper independent, pushing past the pains of both life physically and emotionally. Now, she does seem to be Notland born and is a natural explorer of the mountains seeking out an unearthing hidden treasure mainly. Vegeta is referred to as Uthabiti, someone who is destined to melt down all that is mean and lowly. While she doesn't understand why this name is given to her, she is determined to live up to the name's honor. Uthabiti means resilience in Swahili, which is the most widely spoken African language in the sub-Saharan. So that's an interesting connection there. And also Kachina does have a great interest in music and dance with a lot of her downtime being focused on it. Moving on to Mulani, she is seen as one of the greatest explorers of Notland currently knowing every inch of the land like no other. Now beyond knowing where everything is, she has a deep knowledge of the land and understanding how even time specifically may affect travel. Mulani actually has a great interest in the future specifically and possibly her own specific fate, seeking out answers about her unknowns. Her story seems to be a direction of focusing on her struggles of mapping out a future for herself in a world with instability. Moving on to Kanish. Kanish is a really interesting character coming with a package deal, aka his dragon companion. His name is Ajaw and he is a dragon made of pixels, but also a self-proclaimed dragon lord. Interestingly though, Ajaw lets us know that Kanish comes off as almost indestructible, consistently complaining about his inability to get rid of him, so I'm really interested to find out how they even met and how they're companions in any way if they kind of like hate each other. Obviously, it's really interesting because Kanish has a direct relation with gaming and pixel graphics, and it's kind of giving Silver Wolf vibes. This could be a hint, though, at maybe Kanish having many lives, kind of like the gaming reference of lives in a game. Now, Kanish's actual most interesting lore point is he is a Saurian hunter, 
her, which you can find from his drip marketing. That drip marketing also gives us information that the position is looked down upon in most of the region of Notlin. His lore does give us though some interesting possible hints into the internal politics of the region and the problems that might be happening behind the scenes. We also do get information that there are commissions within the region to rid evil from the Night Kingdom which we suspect from all the lore girlies is also another name for the abyss. Moving on to Chaska, one of the few Notlin characters we know the least about, though some do think she may be a human dragon hybrid. This is due to the fact that her design is like super feathered with her hair in deep reddish purple tones. Personally, I think the design pulls from more of a Western cowboy, but that's just my perspective on it. It will be interesting though to see if she's related to the Saurian hunters in some way or a wrangler of some sort or keeper or like dragon breeder i don't know flipping over to sitlali though we do have her design being thought to be inspired by axolotls her conversation though with mulani makes us come to learn that she is a fortune teller with the ability to at least see a decade into the future it will be interesting to see if she's related to mona in any way or at least the hex and zirkle and possibly other hoyoverse games as she is voiced by march 7th voice actor and let's be honest they both share pink hair and they both kind of have a bit of a brat attitude Moving on, we do have Shilonin, the leopard woman with a Geo vision. Now, it is possible due to the fact that she is Geo that she hails from the same tribe as Kachina, which means she would have a focus on mining and gems. Now, I suspect due to her cat nature, she probably deals with jewelry and gem appraisal and may know about some sort of fascinating gemstones throughout Tavat. There are, though, some previous theories that a version of forbidden knowledge may exist within Notlin as a crystallized form, which may be what Shilonin is looking into or is all about. Of course, Isan, who is our first look into Notlin through the Tavat chapter preview trailer, is here. Now, we've come to learn that the skull is definitely a dragon skull adorned upon her head, leading me to suspect that Isan may be a lot older than her design leads us to believe. Isan's design seems to also feature a possible dream catcher, an item used to ward off evil. With Notlin's story focused around some sort of competition or games, we may see that its true intentions are much more sinister than first suspected. There could be evil lurking within the shadows of such a bright and colorful land, and also, why are they making everyone compete? Are they trying to look for the strongest person in order to get them to do or go? somewhere that's just my opinion i'm not gonna go on think about it one of my favorite in this group is oron who is our final mystery man and truly the most ominous of our starting lineup in my opinion with little to none information the only thing we can take out is his design and make inferences from there now oron is seen to have a symbol on his hand similar to the symbol found on the cubes of the heavenly principles you can also find those symbols on the wall behind the ley line trees found in domains oron is also featured standing next to capitano our main bad guy of notlin due to that reason alone i assume oron has some connection to the Fatui and may possibly be a character tied to the Abyss. Also, based on information that we have, I even suspect he might be like Skirk with the ability to travel long periods in the world below and navigate through the terrors that are hiding there. Interestingly enough, when thinking back to the Electro Tribe with Bats, and their possible connection to the underworld, I do think it's possible he may hail from this tribe specifically. I also think he could have the ability to possibly be the final Fatui member lost in like time or the Ermansel tree in the 10th slot, but that's a whole giant theory for another time and there's not enough information to even make it valid to talk about right now. All right, so we're gonna get into now overall themes in Notlin, starting with Resurrection. Resurrection is definitely the biggest theme by far in Notlin and it might not even apply to just one person in particular. Now hold on, before you fall off your chair, think about it. In the recent story quest of Simulanco, we are led to believe that the Ode to Resurrection may be related to Durin, the dragon that fell upon Dragonspine, whose heart still remains beating since patch 1.2. It's insane to think that the story team has literally been cooking this up since the very beginning, but at least goes to show you that the Genshin lore team really did indeed think ahead and lay the groundwork early for this multi-year possibly decade long adventure. The thing is though, this resurrection could also relate to the Pyro Dragon Sovereign whose current status is unknown to us. And you know who also is unknown to us? Someone named 
Shablanka, I think that's how you say their name. I'm probably butchering that as well. This character alone could be any one of the guest characters on this wall, whether it's a Pyro Sovereign, the Electro Sovereign, possibly the original Archon, possibly the missing Fatui member. And we still, like I said before, don't even know the actual state of the Pyro Sovereign. So that could be another character that is getting resurrected. We also know though that the third Descender was made into the Seven Gnosis and awarded to the Archons. Now, thinking to the Fatui's plan on gathering all the Gnosis and the last Gnosis being the Notlin one, their plan could be to gather them all together and bring back the third Descender somehow. I wish I was done with the possible resurrections, but La Senora, who sadly perished in patch 2.1 and has been the community favorite for possible returns. In the Fatui teaser trailer, A Winter's Night Lazo that I have watched 5 million times, Piero, the leader of the Fatui, alludes to a final resting place within the quote, old world. Knowing the information that we know now, after Fontaine, this could be a reference to Hyperborea, the first cycle in time where the world was unified as one. We also know that the Fatui is working on something called Project Stuja, which when translated means very cold similar to Hyperborea, which when translated means like hyper cold. This could actually be the Grand Fatui plan in which they somehow revert the cycles of this world and bring back the old world along with Senora the Crimson Witch of Flame, who is made up of something called Living Flame and whose boss fight features an ice-like cocoon bursting into her flame form and whose coffin is literally covered in actual ice at the end of the trailer. Also, did you know that the number eight Senora's Harbinger number, along with moths, are both symbols that are tied to rebirth. That's all I'm saying. I've said a lot. Listen, I've been riding this copium train since 2.1. I am not getting off now when this is truly the most likely place for this to happen. I wish I was actually done there when it comes to candidates of resurrection, but I'm not. The final candidate, and there are actually more than that, but this is the one that I'm ending on, is Guizhong. I know someone gasped somewhere watching this video. Before I give the Guizhonginators any hope, this is full copium. So when we saw Guizhong's actual form, it was in a promotional trailer about leeway if i remember correctly for lantern right along with that we were shown shen yun aka the cloud retainer and madam ping within it as well leeway promos during lantern right actually have an interesting trend of sneakily promoting future leeway characters by featuring them in years previous for instance yujin can actually be found in an early promotional video of one of these before her release shen yun did release the following year and many speculate that the cloud retainer will be playable coming up very soon in the up and coming lantern right honestly like grandma ping grandma plunge that means better watch out that's all i'm saying like there's a new girlie in town which not new she's actually very old she's like probably almost dead actually i don't know when like adept i die anyways i don't think at this point it's super crazy to think that with all the resurrection going on in notland that guizhong could come back as well. One, not only is she a god, but two, she's closely connected to Zhongli, along with many of the events of the past that could have insight into a lot of what we don't know about. I don't know. Okay, I like her design. Let's be so, so for real right now. This is purely based on fun. Like, who's going to give us a cute moment? Who's going to slay Senora burning the tree, coming back from the dead? That too. Thank you. Moving on though to other topics, war is a theme that is circulated when it comes to Notland. Now, on first glance with Notland's promotional material, it doesn't seem like there is any war happening at all. Like, let's be honest, it is Pokemon. But this could be Hoyo trying to make us think one thing, but then in reality, secretly having another happen. I will say, in regards to war though, this could be indirectly related to be talking about the war, but more in Notlandian's actual cycle against the evil dragon Nubala. It could also relate to the Conrean War or the Archon War or the Looming War, which has finally been talked about. Since day one of Genshin, the war with gods has been teased as the final climax of Genshin's story. And it seems no matter what we do, that is going to be the inevitable result. And even the Raiden Shogun and Yaimiko alluded to this in a recent conversation in an event. Not Lin and its events could be what sparks, see what I did there? Fire? Sparking? Ignition. Oh, I actually just gagged myself there. Do you guys know what the title is of the trailer? Notlin could be what ignites 
the war against Celestia, like the Notlin trailer ignition. The final thing I will mention is secrets. The final thing I'll mention is secrets, and one in particular, and it's this item that you're seeing right here. Yes, the Pyro Gem Agnidius Agate Gemstone. If you are out of the lore loop, all of the gems in Genshin have lore, and they directly correlate to some degree with the events that occur in the Archon Quest of gems for that region. So, for instance, in Fontaine, the Hydro Gem states, My ideals have no stains. I must correct you. People here bear no sins in the eyes of the gods. Only laws in the tribunal can judge someone. They can judge even me. So praise my magnificence and purity. The Hydro Archon. Hire me Hoyo for Farina if she ever needs a replacement. Obviously, this relates to the theme of Fontaine with the end resulting in Farina being put on the stand and judged by her own people. So, I know you guys want to hear it. The Pyro Gem reads as follows. A pilgrimage for a wish, a battle to earn a name. Burnt to cinders for a dream. If the intention yet remains achieved, redacted's truth he has. I'm not even lying. There is legit a redacted blank in the middle of this damn gem since 1.0. So obviously there's something of secret here, something that Hoyo didn't want any of us to know or have a chance to even know. Now, in that line, we have the imagery of dreams burning, truths being achieved, and battles to earn a title, which definitely the last one, the battles earn a title, seems to be the theme of 5.0 at least. I'm not going to super dive into this, but let me know in the comments your theories on the gem and how it relates to Notlin. I would love to read them on stream and talk about it all. And also feel free to join me on Twitch as well. So we can down below in the description. The last note in regards to secrets is the most obvious with the Tavat chapter preview trailer having a direct line saying, when the God of War shares the secret with the traveler, it's because she has her reasons. Now, this could be a reference definitely to the previous line, but to be honest, almost all of the lines from the entire trailer have ended up having a much deeper and more complex meaning to them. So I suspect there's probably a lot more to that. Now, I think we have to talk about the um, elephant in the room, Paimon, Celestia, mainly Celestia, just words to call Paimon an elephant. I think the last theme that has gotten increasingly more attention finally in this story as it's progressed is Celestia. Within Dane's Liv's recent quest bedtime story, I think that's what it's called, Many of the community's questions to Celestia have been somewhat answered, or at least addressed. Aether and Lumine discuss the inevitable awakening of the Heavenly Principles, and it's confirmed to us that from the past 500 years after the Conrean War has happened, has been a period of dormancy. We also learn that the destruction of the Hydro Throne, which did happen at the end of the Fontaine Archon Quest, would have certainly been more than enough to awaken Celestia due to its blatant disrespect and disregard of the gods. This leads us down a really crazy pathway of why Celestia is still sleeping, but also what will actually cause it to awaken. Now, it is speculated by a lot of people within the lore that Celestia, like many gods within Genshin, follows the same laws of the universe, and usually when gods expend a ton of energy like they did in the previous war of Conria, they need a period of recharge. You can think of this kind of like Nahida and Ruka Devita, where the expenditure of an immense amount of power shrunk them and lowered their level of power theoretically. Regardless, there's no doubt this light into the storyline that Celestia's lore and even eventual involvement will happen at some point. And with many people thinking the burning of the Ermensul tree will conclude the Notlin arc, I can't see anything greater than that awakening the slumbering gods. All right, we're going to get into the cope of copium theories now. This is going to be my thoughts on the end game story of Genshin and what this is truly all leading up to. There are clearly so many people involved, so many different storylines, so many groups. There's no way you'll ever get it 100% right. There's just too much that your one brain, one person's thought not take in all this information and be like, and this is how it all makes sense. But I'm going to try. And let's be real, it's a fun idea to think about. I think Genshin may be a lot more confusing than we think, which I know you're probably laughing because you are watching this video. Celestia is really clearly painted as the bad guy early on into Genshin's story. And I find I even struggle to find a gray area for them to exist within. So this is where it gets crazy. 
when you really start to break down the whys of this story. Why the fake sky? Why the divine nails? Why the Connery and war? Why the intense hatred for forbidden knowledge? Why any of this? I came upon a really interesting theory. You see, in Honkai Impact 3rd, which I am not an expert on, so feel free to correct me down below, and I know the HI3 girlies will. It is to my knowledge that the story ends, spoiler alert, in a rather shocking manner. In one of the mangas, you come to find out that the world is overrun by something called Sky People, an alien civilization hunting through the stars for Honkai energy to harvest. Now, in Genshin, Honkai energy isn't mentioned, but I do believe forbidden knowledge in all of its different forms is the same or at least equivalent. Now, Octavia from the Hexen Circle has recently revealed to us that the world beyond to that is dying and that stars are going out one by one. This leads me to believe the following, that maybe Fanes, the primordial one, came to Tavat in search for a place to protect and nurture humanity within it while the world dies around it as some sort of last hope. Beyond the firmament lies evils of the abyss, but even worse, the sky people searching out Honkai energy. The firmament, aka the fake sky, was put in place as a sort of shield to prying eyes, and Celestia worked hard to keep levels of forbidden knowledge, aka Honkai energy low as high levels would bring aliens sniffing it out. The sky people were the main reason for Welt's transference into the world of Honkai Star Rail, so it's not hard to believe that Hoyoverse may have a plan to introduce this overarching narrative to this world as well. This would mean, if true, that everything we're doing right now towards Celestia for our perceived freedom is to our detriment as it would result in the annihilation of our world and maybe humanity forever. And what's interesting is Ramiria, the civilization that got the closest to peering beyond the firmament, saw something so terrifying that they reversed it. Anyways, you can sit on that and think about it. That was a whole lot though, and as you can see, Notlin is probably going to be a whole lot. I'm really excited though to see what Hoyoverse cooks up over there for the next few patches, and if you're looking for someone to share your crazy theories with and go on this journey with, then feel free to subscribe, or feel free to go head over to my Twitch and hang out with me while we play the Notlin story arc live every day when it comes out. I hope you guys all enjoyed this crazy deep dive into honestly almost everything we need to know going into Notlin. Feel free though to drop down below what you are most excited about and as always I cannot wait to see you in Notlin. Turn on the AC again. I'm boiling. I'm being cooked by this light.